Introduced for the 1984 model year and running through 1988, the Pontiac Fiero is one of the most memorable cars of the 1980s and one of the most memorable Pontiacs ever, perhaps in part because it's the only mid-engine Pontiac ever produced. And until the Corvette went mid-engine with the most recent variant, it was also the only General Motors production mid-engine car of the modern era. Though the car was certainly not without its teething pains, Pontiac went on to sell almost 400,000 Fieros over that run, although the sales figures dwindled considerably year after year after year, in part because the 1984 Fiero, when it was launched, did have a number of challenges. However, at the end of the day, Pontiac designers and engineers created a vehicle that was uniquely its own, and certainly one that was very different from what General Motors had produced to that point. And frankly, it was done on a pretty shoestring budget. We're going to explore in this particular video some of the top 10 facts that you may not have known about the Fiero. And we'll also conclude with an interview with then Pontiac assistant chief interior designer, Mar Fisher, who details what the styling team went through in conceiving the Fiero's interior. This interview can be seen as a bonus feature at the end of this video after we've concluded our top 10 list of facts regarding the Fiero that you may not have known. So stay tuned and click to the end if you want to see it. Let's get started now with number 10, and that is that the interior on the final Pontiac Fiero ended up being a bit different than what designers had originally conceptualized. Let's take a look at this seating buck from General Motors Design back when the Fiero was still in the studios. And You'll notice that the interior looks pretty similar to the final version overall. You can see that console in between the two passengers, and the shifter looks a little bit different than the final version. Less tall, interestingly, here. Not sure why they ended up going with a taller shifter for the manual transmission than what's shown here. But you can see this kind of three-dimensional instrument panel, also a pouch-style glove box, if you will, there on the passenger side. A little bit different style from what would end up on the final car. But take a look at the door panel and you'll notice something that's very different on this particular seating buck in the final car. And that is that this has a pull strap style door pull as opposed to, I guess I'll call it a grab handle style door pull. And you can see it here in the inset what the final Fiero ended up looking like. Not quite sure why Pontiac ended up changing this from this particular pull style. Maybe because all the Pontiac interiors for whatever reason, it was felt that that different style door pull was a brand characteristic and thus the Fiero had to conform to it. But this probably would have been relatively easy for somebody to use whether or not the seat was forward or back versus that other style of door pull where it's just stationary. You can't really grab it in different places. However, take a look at this alternate proposal here that's probably later than the photo that I just showed. And you'll notice that there are two places to grab the door handle to close the door on this proposal. In the final Fiero version, they would get rid of that secondary one, and there would just be one place to grab the door, as you can see here. Probably a bit of a cost savings move. So that was something that was different between what the designers intended, originally at least, and the final production version. Of course, you can see the sheepskin seat covers here, and those would make it through to production, I guess. For better or worse, well, Pontiac was trying some interesting things in their interiors in these days, even real suede in some cars like the 6000 STE. But sheepskin certainly was cool. Let's move on to number nine. And at number nine, we have that the Fiero employed a different engineering process than most typical GM vehicles. Now, when a vehicle is developed at General Motors, it often goes through a product development process that begins at about 185 weeks from the start of production. Back in the early 1980s, late 1970s, that probably would have been closer to about 240 weeks ahead of the start of production. And there are different milestones that have to be met along the way by the design team as well as the engineering team. Well, one of the issues associated with the Fiero is that the budget for the car was relatively small, just $400 million to do an all-new two-place car. It just wasn't a lot of money at the time. And so one of the things that Pontiac Division decided to do was basically sequester the Fiero engineers off from the general Pontiac engineers. And that engineering team was led by an individual named Halki Aldakachi, a Turkish-born engineer for General Motors, very talented individual. 
But GM also had a lot of the engineering done by an outside firm, and the name of the firm was Entech, E-N-T-E-C-H, that was located in Troy, Michigan, founded by an individual by the name of George Milladrag. And Aldacachi and Entech were really the companies that were able to put the Fiero together and to do so in a cost-efficient manner. It, again, seems strange. This was one of the first vehicles, production vehicles, if not the first that General Motors had done, where it had outsourced a fair amount of the engineering. And while the design was all done in-house, the styling of the interior and the exterior was 100% GM. As I mentioned, underneath, there was some significant help from outside in the form of Entech assisting Pontiac's engineers to bring the Fiero to production in a cost-efficient manner. Let's move on to number eight, and that's that the Pontiac Fiero's introduction was delayed for a number of reasons until the 1984 model year. Now, the amount of delay that one attributes to the Fiero program is really dependent upon when you think that the program actually started. Pontiac was trying to produce a sporty two-seat vehicle for some time, all the way back to the mid-1960s, and in particular in 1964 when Pontiac developed a concept called the Banshee, or the XP833, that was a kind of Corvette-esque small two-seater with this long hood, short deck profile that was really in keeping with John DeLorean's aspirations for the division. The Banshee was killed because GM senior leadership didn't want a vehicle from the Pontiac division that could potentially infringe upon the Corvette as its top performer, and so that was shelved. Pontiac later would try to come up with another sporty car, the Pegasus, which was actually a four-seater based on the 70 and a half Firebird. I don't really care for the looks of the Pegasus. You can let me know what you think in the comments. But nonetheless, Pontiac was trying to get something even a little bit more sporty than the Firebird. And actually, Ferrari donated a V12 engine for use in this Banshee. So it's actually not even powered by a General Motors engine. It was powered by a Ferrari engine, and again, this car didn't make it through to production. The Fiero was, however, supposed to come to life as a mid-engine vehicle, and it was supposed to come at least, I would say, a year sooner than what it really did. And this is because in the early 1980s, the auto industry and the American economy went through a recession. General Motors just didn't have the capital to invest in a new program, and they had to wait until the market got stronger and then they could make the investment. This was another reason behind why there wasn't a 1983 Corvette. There was a 1982 model and there was a 1984 model. There just wasn't the capital, especially because this is a two-place vehicle that it really was not known how well it was going to sell. In the end, it did sell quite well, especially in the first model year. GM sold almost 100,000 Fieros. But nonetheless, the car was delayed because of capital constraints, as were other General Motors vehicles at the time. Let's listen here as then General Motors Design Vice President Irv Rubicki talks about the Pontiac Fiero's timeline and why it was delayed for introduction. Did you, you didn't have any trouble selling the program? Oh, there were some hitches in there, yes, because at that time... When we were developing the Fiero, the market went flat in 81 and 82. The car actually would have been brought to market a lot sooner than it had, had the market remained strong. But uh, the capital wasn't there to uh, invest in a new program. And when the market started moving forward and getting stronger, that's when Pontiac got the okay. We were confident that we could probably beat all records for two-place cars in the first year with that automobile, and we did precisely that. We almost sold 100,000 of them in the first year, and no one has ever done that with a two-place automobile. Incredible. And we expect to continue to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it's an incredible story, the Fiero. Let's move on to number seven, and that is the so-called fake rear window on the Pontiac Fiero. Now, many of you know that there were a few styling variations of the Fiero. There was the standard version. In 1984, there was just one version that came out, in effect, and the top-of-the-line car was the SE. But as time went on, Pontiac introduced the Fiero GT that had a completely different look with the so-called flying buttress styling on the rear. But let's focus for a moment on that original Fiero that came out in 1984. And notice that there is what appears to be a rear quarter glass behind the pillar in the middle of the vehicle. Well, 
That was done for purely aesthetic reasons to try to minimize the overall heft of that, we'll call it C-pillar. And to do that, designers came up with this kind of fake rear window, if you will, that appears to be a window, but it's a window to nowhere. It doesn't go up, doesn't go down. You don't even see it from inside the cockpit. It is just there purely for aesthetics from the outside. Now, when the Fiero GT was introduced with the flying buttress styling, there were real windows in the rear, although they really just looked out onto the deck lid. They weren't internal. There wasn't anything behind them inside the car. There was just an area behind them, again, in the deck lid area. But on these first Fieros that were produced, that rear glass, like I said, is just fake and doesn't really do anything aside from minimize the look of that C pillar. Let's move on to number six. And number six, we have the engines that were employed in the Pontiac Fiero and the history behind them. Now, many know that when the Fiero was introduced, it came only with a 90-ish horsepower, 2.5 liter overhead valve Iron Duke four-cylinder engine. And the unfortunate part about that was that the car looked like it could go a lot faster than the Iron Duke could really power it. That 90-ish horsepower really just wasn't all that much. Thankfully for 1985, Pontiac added a V6 to the Fiero that gave it considerably more power and endowed it with, eh, you know, zero to 60 times of about seven and a half seconds as opposed to 10 seconds. But there was good reason for having that Iron Duke four-cylinder under hood, although it's not quite clear that that was what Pontiac had originally intended. The 2.5 liter was a mass-produced engine by GM. It was heavy, cast iron. It was generally reliable and durable for the most part. But I believe that Pontiac actually intended to have an even smaller engine under hood until cafe standards were relaxed. Remember, this was a time frame when automakers thought that by the late 1980s, they were going to have to hit 27.5 miles per gallon. Well, during the Reagan administration, those corporate average fuel economy or CAFE standards were relaxed. I think that's really what allowed Pontiac to put the 2.5 liter four-cylinder engine under hood in the Fiero. It was tried and true, and also it helped from a cost standpoint because they're making so many of them, and it was so relatively low-tech that it was cheap to employ. My guess is that Pontiac actually originally intended to put a 1.8 liter four-cylinder, the overhead cam engine that would show up in the J cars that was sourced from GM Brazil. Now, interestingly, Pontiac would turbocharge that 1.8 liter engine in those J cars, the Sunbirds, etc., and it would give them some considerable scoot. Unfortunately, my guess is that because of the cost constraints associated with building the car, Coupled with the relaxation in the corporate average fuel economy standards, Pontiac decided to ditch the 1.8 liter engine and the potential 1.8 liter engine turbo and just go with the standard Iron Duke four-cylinder engine and later the 2.8 liter V6. Part of this was because of the design of the rear compartment and the suspension that was associated with the Fiero, which we're going to get to in a second. But a fair amount of it was borrowed from other vehicles in the General Motors parts bin. And so the 2.5 four-cylinder and the 2.8 V6 just basically were drop-in engines as opposed to that 1.8 liter and 1.8 liter turbo that would have had to have been, let's say, more considerably engineered for this application. The only proof point I have is this interior photo shot of an interior buck for the Fiero. And you can notice that there's a turbocharged gauge here as part of the seating buck. So my guess is that at some point, a turbocharged power plant was contemplated for the Fiero, and the only one that would really make sense during that time was that 1.8 liter overhead cam engine, although I can't really say for sure. Let's move on to number five, and that is the unique suspension systems, I guess not really unique suspension systems, in the Fiero. I previously mentioned that the Fiero's capital budget was just $400 million, and as a result, engineers had to come up with a way to engineer a mid-engine car, but really using quite a few parts from the General Motors parts bin. So what did they decide to save some money? Well, at least in the early Fieros, the 1984 to 1987 Fieros, those employed effectively a Chevette or T-car front suspension setup. It was basically just a parts bin front end and 
worked decently well for the Fiero. Now, the interesting part is really the rear suspension and the setup there because that was effectively the front suspension from the X cars, the X cars being the Chevrolet Citation, Pontiac Phoenix, Oles Omega, and Buick Skylark. So the Fiero basically took that front suspension setup that was employed on those vehicles, turned it around 180 degrees, and used it for the rear suspension. And this is one of the reasons why I just mentioned the 2.5-liter four-cylinder and the 2.8-liter V6 making their way under hood in the Fiero. Well, no surprise, those were the power plants that were offered in the X cars. So it was really a pretty straightforward and easy adaptation of that setup to the Fiero. Now, of course, there were some modifications, but you will notice in the photo of this four-cylinder Fiero that the engine is turned, let's just call it backwards. And that's a consequence of what I just mentioned, that the rear suspension is effectively the front of the X car is just turned around and the engine is consequently turned around as well. The setup worked decently well. Some people complained about the handling in the first years, but to be honest, especially for the 1984 model year when only the four-cylinder engine was under hood, you weren't going to be going around corners super fast anyway. So this part's been approached, generally worked just fine, although it would end up changing for the Fiero's final model year. And that brings us to number four. And that is that the 1988 Fiero had a one-year-only suspension design. Now, many speculate that the 1988 Fiero suspension design was executed by Lotus because by this point, actually by 1986, General Motors owned about 90-ish percent of Lotus. Uh, but in reality, the suspension design was done by Pinec engineers, perhaps heavily borrowed from the inspiration that they perhaps saw on some Lotuses, as well as what they learned from Pontiac Racing. And it was a significant change to the overall design, and the car also got four-wheel vented disc brakes all the way around, which, again, was different from what the Fiero came with. And like I said, this was a totally revamped suspension, everything from the geometry to the tri-link rear suspension to the setup and the scrub radius that was put in place to help minimize steering effort. Recall that the Fiero never got a power steering rack, and some individuals complained that the steering effort was quite heavy, especially on the GT models that had pretty wide tires. But this was a huge advancement for the Fiero and made the car handle just excellently. It was never a bad handler, but this just took it to another level. And on the 88s with the V6 and the WS6 suspension package, it's really hard to beat them, at least for the time frame from a handling standpoint. Let's move on to number three, and that is the Fiero's original code name was the Pegasus. Now, I mentioned before that Pontiac had developed a sporty vehicle that was called the Pegasus, which had a Ferrari V12 underhood and didn't have that great of looks. For whatever reason, the Fiero was originally known internally as the Pegasus, and the Fiero is actually labeled the P car for General Motors because of Pegasus. Now, somewhere along the way, General Manager Bill Hoagland decided to have the employees of Pontiac vote on the name, and the name was changed to Fiero. But it wasn't before the logo for the Fiero was designed, and you can see it here that there is a horse is the logo of the Fiero. In other words, the logo was designed for a car that was to be named the Pegasus. And I guess that even after the name changed, everybody liked the logo, and so it was kept. It kind of looks cool on the car. Fiero means proud in Italian, I believe. Certainly doesn't mean horse or anything to do with horses. But because of the car's original code name, the logo was designed, the logo stuck, the name changed, and you have the logo as it was released through to production, I believe designed by John Albert, a General Motors designer. Let's move on to number two. And at number two, we have that the Fiero was the first car to pace the Indianapolis 500 with a four-cylinder engine since 1914. Now, as I mentioned, when the car was released in 1984, it had the 2.5-liter Iron Duke four-cylinder engine under hood. 
and 90 horsepower was just not going to be enough to push the Fiero around the Indianapolis 500 track. And so General Motors outfitted the pace cars for the Indianapolis 500 with a 2.7 liter, 165 cubic inch, 232 horsepower super duty Iron Duke four-cylinder engine. So the four-cylinder in those pace cars had more than double the horsepower of the stock Fieros. Now, the Super Duty Iron Duke was a pretty sweet engine, and it's unfortunate that it didn't make it through to production because that certainly would have endowed the Fiero with enough scoot for its looks. But nonetheless, it did pace the Indy 500, and there were Indy 500 versions of the Fiero that were for sale, but if you got one, you unfortunately didn't get that Super Duty engine under hood. Let's move on to number one, and that is that the Fiero was actually sold as a commuter car to General Motors top brass when it was proposed. Recall, as I mentioned before, that Pontiac had tried to introduce some sports cars like the Banshee in 1964 or the Pegasus in 1971 and bring those through to production, but they continually got the kibosh from General Motors' leadership because those individuals were afraid that a Pontiac sporty vehicle would infringe upon the Corvette. Thus, you can imagine that Pontiac division managers were somewhat apprehensive about pitching a sporty car, especially a mid-engine car, to General Motors' top executives because they would get shot down yet again. And so a plan was hatched to basically portray the Fiero as this commuter car and it would help meet the corporation achieve its corporate average fuel economy or CAFE goals, which, by the way, the original Fiero was rated at 50 miles per gallon on the highway, 31 miles per gallon city. So it really was a rather fuel efficient vehicle. But that was the objective of the car as it was sold to General Motors top execs. It had no air of sportiness in the name. They were trying to sell something similar to the Fiat X19 but something that was affordable for young individuals who didn't have children that really could, as I said, be seen as a commuter car. Of course, when this pitch is being made, the General Motors top executives are looking at pieces of paper and not designs for the car. And clearly, when the car was introduced in 1984, it certainly had beautiful looks that would suggest it was more than just kind of a boxy, run-of-the-mill commuter vehicle. Nonetheless, that is how it was sold to GM's top management, and that's why it only had the four-cylinder in the introductory model year because engineers were basically precluded from having it endowed with the performance that was approximating that of the Corvette, and they wanted to stay away from anything that would suggest that it could compete with the Corvette. Of course, just one year later, a 140-horsepower 2.8-liter V6 would make its way Underhood and the Fiero would get, well, relatively close in performance to the Corvette, although it didn't match it. Nonetheless, that was the plan for the Fiero, that it was supposed to be a commuter car to get people from point A to point B, but as we all know, it turned out to be so much more. Let's listen in to yet another audio clip from then General Motors Styling Vice President Irv Rabicki about the Fiero's development. The, the Fiero was a team approach. And um, I guess you could go back as far as 25 years, and we tried to sell a two-place car for the Pontiac division. What was that? Pardon me? Wh which one was that? Well, it was called an XP number. Oh, I see. Some okay. sort. Sell it internally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was internal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we called all our uh, products that weren't in the marketplace, and we were trying to sell something new, like a four-place personalized coupe called right. a Riviera. Mm -hmm. It would have an XP number before it had a name. And the Fiero had many XP numbers over the last 20 years and then um, as we came up into the 80s the opportunity seemed to be right for Pontiac to get into a two-place commuter for a variety of reasons uh, one the new Corvette was going to move into a new price structure and a very sophisticated car as far as running gear and appearance and so forth second to none Mm -hmm. We believe it's second to none in the world. Yeah. You can use the name Ferrari if you like. Mm -hmm. It's a very important name, but this car will do everything a Ferrari will do. It, matter of fact, it'll run a little hotter. 
So the opportunity was there to do what Pontiac was referring to, the Pontiac Motor Division, as a two-place commuter car. Well, it, it would be extremely difficult to get any group in this building to do a commuter mm -hmm. because we believe that if the car is youthful in appearance, you're going to do one hell of a lot better than if you do some stodgy two-place little commuter machine. All right. mm -hmm. And uh, when we started, we started in one of our advanced rooms. Pontiac was just putting their team together. They had a fellow named Hockey L. Dicacci who was in charge of the engineering program. He visited with us many, many times, and we talked about the goals. He, he was telling us about what power he'd use. It should be mid-engine. We wanted it mid-engine. They wanted it mid-engine. So we started downstairs in our advanced rooms. All our advanced studios are on the first floor. All the car divisional studios are on the second floor. And uh, we had several false starts, admittedly, and then this vehicle started to evolve from a sketch and uh, time wore on perhaps a year in that studio as we refined this form a very distinctive silhouette so and that's what we were looking for Dave. we wanted something running down the street that you'd never miss it would have a silhouette that one look at it in the crowd of cars and you'd say that's the Fiero. Mm -hmm. Well, we had the silhouette, but we didn't have uh, the face of the vehicle or the tail of the vehicle, the graphics that would telegraph Pontiac. Mm -hmm. And the Pontiac group had now received approval from the corporation to go ahead with the engineering on this car. Not necessarily that we were going to market with, with the vehicle, but go ahead with the engineering. You can spend X number of dollars and we'll take a look at it again in another mm -hmm. six months. Mm -hmm. Well, when they got it that okay, we decided that the program ought to move into our divisional studio rather than advanced because those individuals are skilled in creating the Pontiac personality. Mm -hmm. so we move the car upstairs and with people like Jack Humbert and John Shinola we went to work and started refining this vehicle, finding the graphics for the rear and the face, the interior group we cut loose to do the instrument panel and the interior environment. And another six months had passed when Pontiac got the okay to go into production. Then we dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's up in Pontiac 2 studio, and the vehicle was released. Now, this, 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 uh, this final go-ahead, where did that come from? The go-ahead yeah. comes from the corporation, the executive committee. The executive committee who takes the recommendation of the product. They, product they look at our clay. Yeah. And they look at the cost of doing the vehicle, and then you've got to project volumes to determine if there's any profit in the program or there isn't. And it was called a commuter car all the way through its development, but it's anything but a commuter car. It's a two-placed, youthful, sporty machine. How'd you come by the midships? Uh, arrangement? Arrangement, yeah. Uh, essentially to produce a two-place vehicle that in no way would uh, mimic the Corvette. Yeah. And there were two-place vehicles out in the marketplace like the Fiat, what is it, X-19, right. X-19. It was a mid-engine car mm -hmm. and a pretty attractive automobile. Mm -hmm. But we were confident we could bring out something that was better than that, more distinctive than that. This, this vehicle in the year and a half it's been out there is, is uh, really appeal to young women. Mm -hmm. If you'll note as you drive down the street and you see Fierro's, Dave, you'll see a lot of young ladies driving them. My daughter owns one. Uh -huh. She's very delighted with it. Everyone was involved with developing the concept of the program, the yeah. planning people at Pontiac, the planning people in our building, the engineering design community. It was a real team effort. The Pontiac engineers were in our studios more than I'd ever seen on any program. Because mm -hmm. here was a whole new machine, a whole new opportunity to give birth yeah. to a new personality. Mm -hmm. That's exciting to a creative team. It must be, yes. Yeah. And it's, it's far easier to do a car that has never existed before yeah. than taking a personality you've had for 50 years or 60 and projecting it forward. That, that's a far more difficult assignment. In terms of, uh, you, know, you, you, you uh, the Fiero came on very strongly as a, as a dashing image, but somehow or other along the line, the, uh, the uh, apparently the engineers were a little conservative about the powering of it, at least the first year. I'm not sure, Dave, that the engineers were conservative. I think they were being careful because okay. in no way could this car nudge the Corvette. So to sell the program. <coughs> 
you talk about a four-cylinder engine with this kind of performance from zero to 60, and Corvette is that much better, so they're, they're really not related. They're two different automobiles. This is in the $10,000 field. That's in the 20. Right. They're completely apart, and on that basis, uh, the program was sold. Mm -hmm. But if you've noticed, this year we have a V6 in it. Right. The performance is exciting. No, it's really exciting. No, once no. you've got the car in the marketplace, you can put in more power and go. <laughs> Well, of course, it's hindsight, but it's, I wondered why, the, why it was underpowered. It was, um, it was, I don't like the word underpowered. Okay. Let, let me put it this Fine. way. The appearance of the vehicle suggested it should go a hell of a lot faster than it did the first year. <laughs> and now for a bonus feature, watch this interview with Marv Fisher, who is then Pontiac's assistant chief designer on the Fiero Interior. All right, well, welcome back to Rare Classic Cars. Here again with Marv Fisher, the, uh, well, the, our esteemed interior design colleague, to talk about a car that I think uh, a lot of viewers really love and own, and I personally own, and that's the Pontiac Fiero. And maybe, Marv, just, this is such an iconic car in Pontiac history and also a bit of a tragic one because it was you know, successful to start and I think a lot of people ended up loving it. Certainly a lot of collectors do. And they were going to continue the lineup. And it kind of similar to what GM did with other vehicles at the time. Once they got it right, they cancel it. And um, But it certainly made a mark on automotive history. Mm -hmm. What was the thought process? And tell us a little bit about when you came into the studio, what the discussion was on this particular car. Well, uh, here, here again, they uh, wanted to put a, uh, a team together that they felt that could capture, you know, a new sportiness and that type of thing. And it was just happened to be uh, a part of my career path that I was a little bit younger, just coming on in stream and that type of thing. So they, I was in uh, Chevy Interior uh, too, uh, worked on uh, some subtle changes on the Corvette, but nothing big there. And then we uh, transferred down to uh, in an advanced studio in, uh, with a couple other uh, more uh, mature, or experienced uh, designers that were s kind of sporting. But I got to feel afterwards, or uh, as the process went along, that they were expecting me to step up and kind of kind of lead lead the thing. Mm. And. Uh, the advanced studio was uh, kind of unique because we didn't have a lot of clay modelers there, and one of the individuals was so good modeling up styrofoam and getting curved to it and whatnot that he actually did it out of uh, styrofoam. And uh, uh, and uh, I'd like to give him a lot of credit for doing that as well. But uh, certainly the driving thing here was the fact that the engine was in the rear of the car and, mm -hmm. and, and not forward. So that really gave uh, some different uh, dynamics to the front. So the, the front of passenger side could go a little bit further forward than uh, normal, which then meant that the, uh, the driver's side or the cluster side and the controls then would be coming uh, back and that was another one of my theories was to get the controls as close as possible and convenient as possible mm. so then the dynamics of the the right side versus the left side you know played a big part of it but the engineers did a good job and used that space uh, quite well I never would have thought to your point that the the mid-engine nature of the car it really influences the instrument panel and the and the shape, but it, it clearly oh, oh, did. Oh, yes, it does. It's, 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 it's a big, big thing. So you're able to push the IP structure forward on the passenger side to get more uh, correct. space. Yeah, right. And then on the driver's side, your kind of, your theme of getting the controls close to the driver, you yeah. created those pods. And, 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 and the pods weren't that big, so they didn't get in your way mm. of your, your, your knees and your legs and that type of thing. Wow. What was the original discussion on some of these themes? I noticed in some of your earlier artwork, there's that a bit of that modular theme too to the advanced. Well, I, I did. You, usually, you start or started out, and it's a little bit more advanced. And and of course, the 
they can't quite handle you know some <laughs> of those advanced stuff so then you constantly have to back off a little bit and refine it and whatnot and the same thing happened when it came out of the advanced studio uh, and it got back up into the production studio and there was a new studio head up there that was working with it and he had a, 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 his own vision of you know some of the forms and shapes you know having smoother contours and that type of thing so so it took on a little different feel as it moved up oh so depending upon the group that you're working with the, the theme took on a bit different right you know, yeah. look to it yeah. I do notice that the the air vents and how they protrude continued from your original advanced mm. work right so I guess it's functional that they're out there where they can blow on you a little bit, or you can reach them to change them. Uh, oh, that, that, that makes that, sense. That, that type of thing. On the passenger side, because the IP is so far forward, if you put the vent in the same plane, you yeah. wouldn't, couldn't reach it probably. Right. And it's all also the, uh, the, 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 the dynamics of it, trying to get it to flow and to wrap around. Mm. And that, that was part of it. Now, I noticed in some of these early seating bucks, you're kind of forced into using the corporate HVAC and radio controls, but you've got a little different theme. This has the push buttons, where as opposed to the slider bar, this you'd push it to activate it. Okay. And then the damper door was electric electrically activated, so it's a little bit different. Yeah, I think they gave you a little bit of freedom to, uh, to alter some of those things. It didn't have to be a corporate part, and uh, you, you can modify it because I don't think some of those things are too expensive to uh, achieve. Hmm. No, I don't think so. And, uh, you know, we, we originally uh, felt that we wanted some gauges up high there to be a little bit sporty or whatnot, but that got to be too much, so we backed away from that. Hmm. In the, and I think uh, on some of the GTs, this gauge pod came back, but it is missing. It's funny, you, you have a turbo boost gauge on there. The really? car never got a okay. turbocharged engine. Okay. Maybe you were you, wishful thinking, I guess. Maybe. But you do, I think one thing that's interesting in the Fiero work, as well as some of your other work for Pontiac, there's almost like a theme on st uh, the stereo and the sound. And uh, the, here there's a subwoofer meter. And later mm -hmm. some Pontiacs had a dynamic control in the car that you could adjust um, the bass uh, overall and how the, the, sound, uh, the sound of the radio. Was that one of the things that the studio team really was passionate about? Or? Well, I, I think it's probably more uh, an engineering, uh, you know, influence, trying to get in there and, and contribute, mm. you know, which is fine. Got it. Which is fine. Now, in terms of the seating, did you find any challenges with this type of package arrangement to get the seating mm -hmm. correct? Or? Well, I, I, I think we found that we did probably a little bit more lateral support than we would normally do, being more of a sport car and uh, whatever, so lateral support and, and uh, you and uh, fooling around with uh, some of the fabrics and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny yeah. you mention that because this one yeah. made it through to production. This yeah. particular fabric, so it kind of gives me a, a, a western feel to it. Uh, was that mid, was mid, that mid, you? Mid, you wanted to put it in there? Uh, I'm not totally sure. <laughs> <laughs> kind of but a playful yeah. western theme, I guess. Yeah. And I notice this uh, this door pull, if you will, later became a mm -hmm. handle. Is that, I think, in Pontiac for a while, they were really big on that handle almost being a mm -hmm. character theme. They had to help close the door and reach it and to pull it down back and side and whatnot. There I was probably trying to get more of a flow, a horizontal theme. And uh, some of wanted to do a more of a vertical, maybe more functional. Oh, uh, so you wanted this pull to kind of have yeah, around, reinforced. Wrap around and, uh, so you, you could grab it, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in different areas depending on your stature and your arm length. Oh, so it's, I see, so the pull's so long that it enables a short person who's got the seat up to close effectively. Exactly. So you know, it, it seemed to me uh, to be a little more functional, more very... Uh, Wow. On it there, so 
you know, some of this stuff I think maybe happened maybe a year or so later. Yeah. Right. The, 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 the different uh, characters and whatnot. And that's a big, uh, was that a big consideration, particularly in this car, you know, just making sure that with the sporty package that you've got enough mm -hmm. sight line through the glass, and I'm sure that's a, a consideration on all the vehicles that you have to do. But yeah, right. How do you, what do you have to think about when you're trying to design an interior like this? What are some of those considerations that you're really thinking about? Mm -hmm. Well, we, we had some good support with uh, some engineers when I first started, uh, you know, design work there, and that was before there was uh, computers, and, and, uh, and w they had actually engineers come in there and set up their tripods and directional a elements there, checking angles oh. of, on the actual design to make sure you could see all your warning lights and so forth. So, but of course they they improved over that with uh, the technology and the computer version there. So we didn't have to struggle uh, too much there because somebody was there, you know, checking and making sure that everything ah. was okay. But you, you can see here the, the dynamics of the instrument panel being so far forward here and then the, uh, the cluster here uh, staying back and within reach of the uh, steering thing. But it didn't want to be too big, otherwise, you know, you're going to obstruct knees and, and what have you. So there's quite a bit of dynamics going on there, fo mm. fore and aft. Interesting. There. And I noticed this looks like it's a later one because this, this also made it through to production, this kind of stripe in the right. fabric, and you see the, the different door handle here and a mm -hmm. pouch for, you know, your map pocket. Or right. Now, what's interesting, though, Marv, is it looks like there's another little cutout here in this door pole. That didn't make it through to production. Okay. Probably somebody told you that costs too much. You just have to stick yeah, with it. Yeah, well, one's enough. Yeah. One's enough? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder, is that something that, you know, perhaps to your point on the, the pole, the longitudinal pole, enabling short and tall drivers? Uh, I'm sure it, it was because if you open the door too far, then can't you'll, get you, it. you'll find that this one was easier to reach than the other one. So for anybody who's got a Fiero yeah. and you can't reach the door when it's open, uh, yeah. you were trying your best, but somehow it didn't make it through. Well, maybe it's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got, this one's one of my favorites too, that you've got a, a sketch from, this is dated uh, September of 1980, so pretty early on. And this is back, uh, some of the viewers may or may not recognized, but mm -hmm. Pontiac was going through this alphanumeric phase, mm -hmm. the J2000, which later became the Sunbird, mm -hmm. the 6000, and then the Fiero was the P car. It was going to be the P3000, but this is a this is a sketch that doesn't only show the seating pattern, has some other uh, ancillary elements too, Mark. And, and that's quite, quite interesting, <laughs> 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 because it was during this time here that uh, I was looking to get married. Oh. And, uh, and, 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 and some studios I had a little bit more time and uh, I was able to, you know, express myself and my, <laughs> in, my interests at that point. <laughs> so is there anything as you think back on the Fiero program in the interior, anything that you were really pushing for that it didn't make it through or something you're especially proud of that that did. I mean, the overall theme was quite radical for the, the time. But well, I, I think it was fairly successful in getting that cluster pot to come out mm -hmm. and be its own element, and then the rest of the panel uh, step back. So, you know, that, that, that's the main uh, success story uh, on, you know, on that as, as well. Great. Well, thanks so much, Marv, for talking about really a seminal car in automotive history, and uh, you know, you and your team played quite the pivotal role in the interior. So, well, thank you, thank you. Well, thanks again, Marv. Okay.